This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Motherhood is as much experiential as it is experimental. It gives us so many opportunities to feel unfit and inadequate. But the truth is, we learn as we go, and we grow as we go. 100 years from now, it will not matter what my bank account was, the sort of house I lived in, or the kind of car I drove. But the world may be different because I was important in the life of a child. Forrest Whitcraft This poem was a beautiful reminder for Morella to really be present with her daughter and to enjoy each moment, especially the ones that seemed small and mundane. Her worth and significance didn't come from providing her daughter with big material things. Rather, it came from Morella being herself, the mom. It came from how she showed up every day, her tone, her attitude, her words, and her corrections. It also came from the ways she showed love, patience, calmness, compassion, gentleness, and so much more. None of these things are material in nature. On the contrary, they're spiritual and can be given freely. Morella's role didn't require her to be perfect. It asked her to be present, invested, and committed to raising her daughter the best way she knew how. Valeria interviews Morella Acebo, She is the author of S.O.S. for the Mom, a Christian mom's guide to managing emotions. Morella is also an actor, speaker, life coach, and mom, a.k.a. the Life Coach Mom. She has over 10 years of experience leading and teaching women in the area of spiritual growth and personal development. Her passion is to help the everyday busy woman rediscover who she is and gain a fresh perspective about her many roles in life. She brings honesty and hope, plus a little humor to daily conversations. Aside from her work as a life coach, Morella has over 15 years experience in the TV industry. She has appeared in many films, television, and national commercials. Meet Morella at lifecoachmom.net. Here's the interview with Morella Acebo. In your own words, who is Mirella Acebo? Well, there's so many layers to me. On a um, personal level, I am a woman of faith. I'll start there because that informs every part of my life. And that's the lens through which I I see life. Uh, I'm a, a wife. I've been married almost 25 years. I have two children. So I'm a mom. I am a creative I love to learn. I love to think. I love one-on-one conversations, meaningful, deep conversations. I love to laugh, encourage people. That's me on a personal level. On a professional level, I am an author. I am an actor. I've been acting for about 16 years. I am a life coach, life coaching women and moms and helping them just embrace their life and be present and grow as they go in every season of motherhood. And uh, as I said before, I'm a mom. So I'm a life coach and I'm mom and I call myself the life coach mom. And so that's me (laughs) in a nutshell on a professional level. I guess we were talking off record about spirituality. I can't help it, but ask you this open question about spirituality. Uh, What is your understanding of spirituality, Mirela? As a whole, what is the goal, actually, of the spirituality that you embody? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I believe that we are more than just one thing. We are more than just physical beings living in a tangible world. There's more to us. There's parts that are invisible to Mm -hmm. us. There are mysteries beyond Mm -hmm. what we can see and understand with natural eyes. So yes, we're physical beings, but there's also our intellect. There's our will. There's our emotions. There's a spiritual component to us. I believe that we were created to live forever. So we're having a physical experience here in a physical world, but that we are spirit. And the spirit is meant to connect with God, our divine creator. Mm. Yes. Yeah, very much is. That's something that has really fascinated me that so many of us have this idea, understanding, perhaps coming from the brain only, that we are just, uh, you know, one thing and that we are temporary. Then once we lose the body, then that's it. Then there's nothing else. I think atheists think that way. It always fascinated me, you know, how, how can this be? So I love the way you said that before something, yeah, you grow as you go. God, I never heard it that way. I love that. I just made a note here and I had, I had to say it again. So how did you become interested in spirituality? How did you become a Christian? I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised by a single mom. I never met my dad. And my mom, I mean, the earliest memories I have is of me going to church every Sunday with my mom and going to a variety of churches. And, you know, as a single mom, um, it was a struggle. She definitely struggled. I mean, she was an immigrant from Mexico, so only speaking Spanish. She didn't speak English. She had a sixth grade education from where she's from. And she's here in this country and alone. And she found a spiritual family. She found faith. She was introduced. She was she was uh, invited to church, and that changed her life. And consequently, my own. The trajectory of my life has changed. So I grew up in the faith and walked away for about ten years. So as a teenager until my late twenties, and then I circled back around because now I was searching for uh, questions. I'm sorry, I was searching for answers to those deep questions. Why am I here? What does this mean? And I was in a place of struggle and I needed help. And that's where I I came back as an adult asking those tough questions. Are you real, God? Mm. (laughs) What is the purpose of my life? Like those questions that we, we wrestle with. And also my mom had been on such a health journey all my life as a little girl. I saw her struggle with her health. And so it was in my late twenties where I saw her, her health really decline. And there was a lot of uh, emotion there, suffering and pain. And I saw her resilience. I saw her persevere through that. I saw her attitude in that, and she was diagnosed with cancer and Parkinson's and osteoporosis. She had a whole list of health challenges. And I saw her stand firm in her faith during the toughest seasons that anybody can go through. And that caught my attention. And I thought that if that's what faith can do, I am missing out. I owe it to myself Mm. to search. Wow, that's a beautiful story in itself. <laughs> I know you have so many, 45 minutes, not enough. Yeah. Um, but wow, how amazing. I have, I have too many questions here for you already. <laughs> what a yes. strong woman. The strength, the resilience of human beings, then what faith, what spirituality can do. And that's true. How that's right. Kind of opens the heart in the sense of acceptance. That's what I see too, right? Peace, acceptance, all these that's right. precious skills per se. Uh, to have as a human being. So I guess a question that I want to ask you, I know the suffering of your mother is, how do you make sense of suffering? I see suffering as a part of life. It's a part of life. It's nobody's immune to it. There is pain and suffering. And I see it as really, it's, it's one experience of many that we're intended to have. It's one end of the spectrum. I don't see us 
living, and I don't think God wants us to live in a place of suffering. It's not his will for us, but there's certainly a lot of growth that comes from a place when we are stripped down, stripped of our ability to control or our thinking that we have control. We don't have ultimate control over everything that happens to us. So suffering is a consequence of things that are happening around us, things that happened to us or things that didn't happen, Mm, that should have happened. And we all contribute to this problem of suffering Mm. in some way. Uh, yeah, that really is a very insightful answer. Beautiful and insightful to me. Yes, we all contribute to our own suffering. And I see that as ignorance, not in a pejorative way, but in the way of ignoring what is true. The more we ignore this interconnectedness of everything, the presence of God, the spiritual energy that's here now, the more we tend to suffer. (laughs) Really, that's how I perceive this idea of suffering. But the interesting thing is we have seen people who have given everything to God in a sense of devotion, of deep understanding. They are just incredible human beings, almost like non-human, but they still suffer. The body still suffers. They still get diagnosed with cancer and then they're in pain. But there's something about them that's different is the way the relationship to pain or to the body is not the same as most of us. There's Mm -hmm. right today, like your mother, there's, there's that level, that deep level of peace that comes to me. It has to come from the understanding that we never die. That's okay Mm -hmm. to let go. It's okay to accept what's happening as it is. I guess with that in mind, another question, guys, I would, I would go on and on and on. I want to talk about your book, <laughs> but sure. I love the topic of spirituality. And I know your book is too. all about too. So SOS for the mom, a Christian, Christian mom's guide to managing emotions. So that's the title since I mentioned the book now. So what is the goal? <laughs> I guess that's a question that I have been asking for so long. And now I have some ideas, but uh, I still ask some of my guests. I'll ask you. What is your vision? What is your idea for the afterlife, per se? Is there such a thing as afterlife or perhaps another realm, another reality where we don't suffer as much as we suffer here? Or do we keep coming back here and and going through this journey, this interesting journey? My view on that, my perspective is the Christian perspective, which is, yes, there is absolutely an afterlife. There is a heaven. There is a place where we will meet with God. Our spirit will meet with God face to face and we will exist without the pain and the suffering and the trials and all of that that is part of this physical world. That will be removed. The old will pass away and there will be a new place, a heaven. It's the ultimate union with our creator. Mm. Yes, of course, I'm familiar with the idea, the concept of heaven. And I guess because I have seen my understanding comes a lot from Buddhism and in Advaita Vedanta. So what I try to, let's say, embody is this heaven that you speak of here on earth. And then I wonder if it is possible because I have seen, I have heard about people who have lived as if they were in heaven here, mm-hmm. that they were so connected. They, they were already like united with God that nothing was a problem anymore, <laughs> per se. They were always at peace and happy and they were already walking in heaven, but perhaps not from the, the understanding most of us have of heaven being a physical place like earth. For, the, for these people, earth is just another level of reality. It doesn't get in the way from the unconditioned love and peace. It's still accessible. I guess that's the idea I have. The information, of course, the knowledge I have from reading and, and trying to understand those, those levels of, of spirituality, going deeper into it. I don't know if it makes sense to you, Mirella, but... It, it does. And, and, and I would describe it differently you know, from a yeah. Christian perspective, similar... Yeah. but with different wording. Can we experience heaven on earth? Yeah. And the answer 
in my opinion, is yes. Mm -hmm. But that is available through our relationship with Christ. Christ, who was fully God and fully human. And he came to usher in a new way of life, this the spiritual life to bring us back to life, to be reconciled with God the Father. So that mm. that experience, that heaven is not just for our afterlife. It begins the moment that we receive mm. Christ into our hearts when we believe that he is God in the flesh. He is here to reflect who God is to us and lead a life with, with in, in that alignment, in that relationship, because then he gives us his spirit. So this is God's spirit in us. And with his spirit in us, it does, he does produce an experience, one that you described, one that is that is full of love, patience kindness, goodness, gentleness, all of these things, all of these things. That's his promise to us that we are no longer living life on our own or by ourselves or in our, our own strength that there is a strength that is greater than our own and we when we rely on his spirit to then lead us it changes every part of our lives, mm. so long as we're surrendered to his spirit. And the old passes away. I go back to that. It's our old nature mm. versus this new nature that now is available yes. through Christ. Yes, a billion times <laughs> to that truth. Yes, so it's through Christ consciousness. Yes, I mean, I, I have heard it that way. It's the same thing, of course. We just use different language, but it goes back to the same message, fundamental message in truth. Incredible to see that. Uh, thank you for answering those questions, Pirella. <laughs> sure. So um, you wrote the book, SOS for the Mom. Talk to me about the main inspiration and also the purpose of writing your book. Yeah, so this, the genesis of this story, of this book idea, goes back to my relationship with with my own mom. I had a great upbringing, a very humble upbringing, not a lot of material things, but but definitely there was a richness there, a, a, a love there, um, the, the, the spiritual component, the faith that, that was introduced to me very early on. And so uh, when I had become a mom, my, my kids were very young. They were one and three years old, and that's when I lost my mom. And that was a very difficult season. Here I was, a new mom, having just lost my mom, grieving the loss of the only parent that I had. And I had walked that very difficult season with her. And that was very exhausting, very draining, very conflicting to me because of my own heightened emotions, the guilt that I was feeling of, am I doing enough? Have I done enough? Is there more? What else is there? I was becoming impatient, just my myself and angry. And it was so layered, so layered. And so my mom passed. I have young kids. Being a mother, that awakens to you to, uh, to a whole new level of oh. Oh, yeah. emotions <laughs> and to the nth degree. It's it's just some all of these things, the worry that all of these things are birthed within us when we birth a child or when we become moms, however that that comes. Mm -hmm. And so that early season of motherhood was hard. It's hard as is bringing life into the world and caring for a new life, and it it um, tests you on every level. And so I walked that journey with others, within community, with friends from church, small groups, classes on motherhood, all of those things. And as I walked this journey, and now you know, my kids are adults, I look back and the idea for this book came because I wanted to Talk about what are 10 things that I wish I would have known back then? What would have helped me? Now, I, I only read a couple books back then. 
And there was one main book that was really being passed around back then. And that, that taught me more of the practical things, napping schedules, feeding schedules, very useful book, but it didn't speak to the emotional journey that I would be on. And so I wanted to write a book, make it simple and help validate the emotions that we feel as moms. And so I reduced it down to only 10. I picked 10 emotions. There's so many more, but I reduced it to 10. So the book is 10 chapters, 10 emotions, and 10 Bible moms that I think could help us with these emotions. So I connect emotions to the different Bible moms, mainly from the Old Testament. So it gave me an opportunity to revisit scripture, read these stories where these mobs are involved. There's not a lot that we know about them. Scripture doesn't go into detail about what they were feeling, but you know, I, I believe moms are moms, regardless mm -hmm. of in what point in history we live. Uh, Emotions are, are part of our humanity. And so I believe these moms were also feeling similar things to us. Did they experience mom guilt? Were they overwhelmed? Were they impatient? Did they worry? Did they suffer? And so as I went back and read these stories, I looked through that lens of motherhood. What was it like? What, what was it like for, uh, for Noah's wife, you know, Noah who built the ark, his wife to, he, she was raising children in a secular world. And then she has this huge calling on her life, her and her husband, to build this ark. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. These stories, yeah. by the way, from the Bible yeah. are, are pretty out there. They, they, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> they are. Huh. But when you have spiritual mm -hmm. eyes to read it differently, mm -hmm. God show, informs us and grows our faith. And so I went back and I looked at those stories and I thought, wow, this is a woman of faith. This is a woman who I'm sure was overwhelmed by the size of this assignment on her life, knowing the world was going to end. And yet she had a calling on her life. So I, I go through different stories. I, I go through, you know, start with the, with the story of Eve, Adam and Eve. And, and uh, most of us are familiar with the story giving into temptation and her life changes. And so I started just to think about in my own life, the temptations that I feel, the guilt that I feel over decisions that I have made or am making and, and, and our tendency to be so hard on ourselves over past failures, past mistakes, and what can we learn from that? And so that's es essentially what the book is about is learning from these 10 moms. What would they say to us today? And who is God in these stories? How did he help them? How did he show up for them? And so because of my Christian perspective and my faith, and when I look at back at, at these stories, first, it helps me set aside my own story, my own experience, and step into the shoes of a different mom. And it gives me, it validates my emotions because I know that I'm not alone. Right? If, if these are emotions were felt by Bible moms, they're felt by the moms that uh, who uh, I live life with, who are my friends. And so we're not alone. So that's mainly what I wanted to communicate to moms, to encourage them and to help support them in saying, you are not alone. Our emotions are gifts. They certainly are gifts. And we have this ability to feel deeply. And that's because we care deeply about so many things, about the people in our lives. And so, yes, attached to that is the emotions. And, and I think we're experiencing emotions all the time throughout the course of our day. Our life is very experiential. And as things happen, happen, or as we come across different things throughout our day, it's landing. We have an experience. We have an emotion about it. And so that's okay. Embrace that side of ourselves. But also, there might come a point where some of these emotions, the more than I would say, categorize them as the negative emotions, right? The worry, the overwhelm, the impatience. If we are, if we are being dominated 
by those emotions and they are harming not just ourselves, but our relationships, then it's time to figure out ways to manage them. Mm. So I say all emotions are valid. I believe you. Mm. Whatever it is that you're feeling, Uh I believe you. But how is that impacting your life? How is that impacting your relationships? And do you want help in this area? Yeah. So that's what this book offers. Wow, a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's very compassionate. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love the piece of community too, right? You're not alone. Um, yeah. That's a big one. For some reason, we tend to think that way when we are kind of dwelling, right, with our own emotions, especially the negative ones. I, I don't even yeah. actually see them as negative. They're just of low vibration per se. They're kind of closer. Yeah, they're, it's. I don't see anything as good or bad. They just are, as you said, beautifully we are meant to experience everything. This is what this is about, the, the human experience. It's called the human experience for a reason. It includes everything. So I guess the question that came to me is, what would be, from your perspective, the most a challenging emotion related to being a mom, if there is one? Worry. I find that our minds are overactive, constantly worried about the future, the future of our kids, their well-being. We're worried about the past. Did we screw them up because you know we we either did did something or failed to do something? And then we're we're worried about the present day, the things that are happening right in front of us. And so there's this this timeline of worry constantly on our minds. That that's what I find in most of my conversations and. And conversations I have with with moms, I find how quickly it turns to the emotion that's being felt. So I'm overwhelmed. I, you know, I started to rest, really listen to those emotional cues when somebody's sharing something personal with me about their journey. Is I'm feeling over, overwhelmed about this, and I'm worried that my child is you know, X Y Z or. Uh, so I would say those are the probably the two the two big things that I hear most regularly be feeling overwhelmed. And I think partly is because of our overactive thought life. We're overwhelmed with life in general. Yes, there's a lot that we're responsible for. Mothers, I consider ourselves, we are leaders in our homes. And we are constantly feeling like we're responsible for their entire well-being, for our kids' entire well-being, present and future past. We just take on so much. And that is overwhelming in and of itself. Caring for oneself is overwhelming. And then Mm. when you have children on top of that, you have a spouse, you have family, we have jobs that we go to, neighborhoods, community, right? We just, we take on so much. True. So, so true. I wonder if the underlying root, let's say emotion or cause for worry and overwhelm would be fear. I usually love seeing the big picture of the root cause of something, the big picture of anything, and then also what causes something to arise. Would you say fear, Mirella? Yes, I agree. You see, fear is something that is such an interesting feeling, emotion, because a lot of times we cannot actually do much about it. It just shows up in the body, right? Even when the mind is not involved. So how do we learn to understand fear, perhaps? I would say first to validate it, that fear is real. Let's not judge ourselves for having that emotion of fear. The world gives us so much to fear, so much to worry about. When I look at the news, when I look at headlines, when I open up Google, there's so much, so much information that produces fear. How do we face that? I think it's part of it is recognizing we don't have control Mm. Uh, beyond what's in our hands to possibly control. If we even can control that, I don't know. Right. (laughs) Right. But also just to recognize what's in my realm, what's in my hand that I have responsibility over what's in what, what am I responsible for 
because I can spend my thought life on all the things that are all outside of my reach of impact. And if I am filling my mind with all the things that are happening in the world, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be aware, that we shouldn't educate ourselves about the bigger issues, but we also have to have boundaries on that. Be aware of what's happening globally, zoom out, and then also know that we have immediate impact and influence over the people in our lives, in our homes, around us. And we can be an impact, we can impact them for good. And so I think that's what our responsibility is, is what am I, what am I here to do? What am I here to teach my children? What's the legacy I want to leave behind with my family and friends? And I think that's so empowering is to be able to identify, to recognize what is my contribution to the here and now and the legacy I want to leave behind. And there's no fear in that. This is what I'm here to, to contribute for the days that I'm here, for the years that that I'm here to do. And so to, to switch our focus, to have a different perspective, not just one that's fear-based, but one that, that's more contribution-based, really. Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful replacement mm-hmm. yeah, for that. You know, I have to go back to spirituality and faith in the sense of related to fear. It feels to me Like when we realize that we are spiritual beings, that we never die, not in that reality, the spiritual reality is always here, it never goes away. So that should, should, you see, dispel or kind of be the antidote to fear. So Mm -hmm. it really feels that way, Mirella. And that's why it's really contradictory to me when I see, you know, some people working so hard and their spirituality through religion and through so many other, you know, so many other ways. But they're still afraid. They're still, let's say they're not at peace. They're mm-hmm. not in acceptance. That really kind of shows something. Would you say that that's because they have not understood or they have not realized the truth yet or embodied the truth? What happens when contradictions like that happens? Because fear and love, they can't really operate together. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yes. And I'm glad you circled back to that because, yeah, I would say the antidote to fear is faith, is faith. And so somebody who's operating in contradiction to that, first of all, that's a very, it's very human. We're all on a different journey. And so part of, and I go back to, you know, we grow as we go. Mm, Love that. Growth (laughs) is the answer. (laughs) Growth is always the answer. So for somebody who is a faith-based person and living in contradiction to what our faith prescribes, then the growth for that person is to step into faith, is to reclaim their identity of what they believe is true. And so for me as a believer, as a Christian, so I have to ask myself, if I'm living in fear, okay, let me acknowledge that. That's my human response. One one of the principles of our faith is I now have God's spirit in me. If I really believe that that's true, how am I acting on it or not acting on it? Because my faith shouldn't produce fear. It It shouldn't allow me to stay stuck in fear. God's always trying to grow us grow me from that place. There's a starting point. And he wants to now grow me into this this new creation that's available as we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So that would be my explanation from my perspective. Yes, yes. And I love again how compassionate you are. You go back to acknowledge the feeling, right? We are humans. I mean, the body, uh, mind, the absolutely. body. Absolutely. It's what we yeah, call Yeah, acknowledging what's true, not denying it, not putting it on the shelf, not dismissing it, you know, allowing to allowing yourself to feel the feeling that's real because we want to always be honest with where we're at. Without that honesty, I don't know that we can go anywhere from there, right? But to have that honest, vulnerable, 
acknowledgement of this is how I'm feeling and then ask ourselves the question, what else is true? What else is true? When I shift my perspective, when I zoom out a little bit, right, as a woman of faith, what else is true about my purpose here, who I belong to, my identity, right? All of those things. Yeah. Asking those deep questions, right? Yeah, that's a beautiful way of navigating those challenging situations we find ourselves in with the yeah. emotions. Yeah, asking questions. I love, I love, love that. I don't know, you probably have heard about the ego, no, the idea, the concept of what the ego is. Have you? This is more like think, Eastern kind of I idea. have, but refresh my memory. Yeah, if you're going to ask me about that, yeah, I want to yeah, define our definitions. <clears throat> right, ego. Well, so because what came to mind was the embodiment of the spirit. It seems like it's a work for a lifetime, isn't it? Because the oh, body it has been, it has felt separated for so long and not belonging here and mired in fear. So now whenever we realize that, we, you know, intellectually that we are not really only the body, that the spirit's here and it's here to help, then as easy as we think it is, that it just magically it will, you know, um, Right. become true, everything will be perfect and there'll be a peace forever uh, in this body-mind. It doesn't really happen like that. So I guess the idea of the ego is, is this false idea, understanding, belief system that we are the body and mind only. And mm. because we have, and that's the understanding I have, because we have been identified with the body-mind only for so long, then it's natural that it, it, it's just kind of it's running, it keeps running the show. It's almost like a program mm. that keep, it runs itself and we yeah. and now it's not easy to just put a stop to it all together I mean that's what it feels like but I love your perspective of treating it almost like as a baby <laughs> being very compassionate as you would be with a child always always leading with grace and with love because that's what Jesus did that's how that's what God is about is that he sent Jesus he came down as a man and he's here not to condemn us, but he's here to save us from ourselves. Mm. And, and he leads with always with grace. Grace first. Grace mm. is that undeserved favor on each one of us. Mm. And then the truth that we can't be all we're created to be without recognizing who we belong to. Ah, And, and that is... Not it's very different from trying to be graceful, peaceful, loving, and kind. Correct. Right, Mirella? Yep. It's very yep. natural when it comes from when you come from that space. Oh. Yes. Our efforts, yeah, our willpower is not enough. My strength, it is not enough because I'm in my flesh. And so I know that when I get tired, when I'm exhausted, when I'm hungry and I get hangry, oh, yes. right? I can't yeah. deliver on all those things I that I'm that I'm called to. <laughs> Yeah. Talk, call to do and how to mm -hmm. treat people and have eyes of compassion and mm -hmm. and look out for other people and I I, I can't do that by myself I, I I'm limited <laughs> my flesh is limited <laughs> mm. yeah and so to be able to rely on a power that's greater than ourselves mm. oh that's that's the game changer right there yes so there's a, a level of surrender of the identification right with the body mind only right. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about comedy. <laughs> uh, I was laughing at some of the videos on your website. So <laughs> I, I love that though, because that's, we need more, you know, this, we are talking about topics here that they are very deep, you know, and serious yes. in nature because they are important in, in the sense of having the experience that we are meant to have in, in, this, in this life. I love that you are kind of bringing comedy into it anyway, <laughs> but I don't think you... I didn't see any videos on spirituality, really, but probably they are there around right? YouTube, but I didn't see them. Do you also actually create, let's say, stories and comedy around uh, spirituality? Do. You do. Uh, wow. I do. Well, yeah. I call it <laughs> scripture inspired comedy. So that's on my yeah. ah, website. Wonderful. I don't know where you saw my videos. On well. your website, not on YouTube, but I saw on your website, some of them, not all of them. Some. Oh, you know what? My scripture inspired ones, are, I don't think are there because I only uploaded a certain number of them. But on my YouTube channel, 
which is Life Coaching by Morella, I do have a series of scripture-inspired comedy. And so basically, I just allow a, a scripture verse to inspire a satire of some kind. And because I work mostly with moms, women in general, but a lot of them just happen to be moms, um, there's a whole series on being a salty mom and judgment. The big one is on uh, on judging. So it's basically me embodying a super judgy mom and a know-it-all. And so it's a character I created and I judge all sorts of different scenarios. Yeah. Yes, I was laughing at that one, right? The salty is <laughs> a salty mom. Yeah, that was a funny one. And you actually have in your book, you have the quote like to me. I love mm -hmm. quotes. So you, you say that about judgment. Don't be afraid to ignore other people's advice. People will always have an opinion on how you should raise your children. Be gracious. Yes. <laughs> Thank them and move on. <laughs> that's, oh, you should be feeding you. I mean, this is, that's, this is a very powerful, empowering subject because I just mentioned early, you, you talked about community, how important it is. And I know too, being connected to ourselves first. And then to me, the spirit first that comes always should come first. And then to the body, mind, what it's doing now and where we want to go with this. And then with other people, environment and all that. But then when it comes to people who are not yet there in a sense of understanding of their own spirituality, yeah, how do we learn to deal with them? <laughs> how do we relate with them? Although you know, we, we love them, but we don't like the way they behave. So yeah, talk to me for a moment about that. <laughs> in terms of motherhood? Yes. In yeah, let's, now let's keep it uh, within the, the topic of being oh. a motherhood. That, that'll be more important for this conversation, I would say. Yes. So going back to, yeah, that everybody has an opinion and everybody yes. thinks that they know how to do it better than you kind of thing. <laughs> that's what <laughs> yeah, we're talking that's about, a funny right? one. Yes. Yes, there are no shortages of opinions from everybody around us. And so what I like what I like to acknowledge first is their intent. Thank you for sharing that. They just acknowledging that most people mean well. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. If it's somebody who I'm close to, give them the benefit of the doubt. If it's unsolicited, advice. <laughs> yes. I think yeah. <laughs> I think it is our responsibility to grow. I go back to that, right? We grow as we go. So these are opportunities for us to grow up and have a courageous conversation or a way to, you know, assert ourselves and to say, you know, I appreciate your feedback and that could be that. I mean, that essentially could be enough. Just, you know, I appreciate your feedback and this is what feels right to me. And that's it. Yes. So it doesn't need to be an argument. It doesn't need to really mm -hmm. go beyond that, but asserting your own boundaries on what you welcome and what you don't. And so even having a, a conversation saying that's not really helpful to me right now, but I appreciate your input. And when, yeah, when I, when I need, I need encouragement right now. That's a really good one. I think to state what it is that you need and want instead of the feedback that ap appears or sounds critical or judgmental. Say, I appreciate that, but would it really what I'm looking for is your encouragement right now, is support right now. Um, so knowing what it is that you need, what you want in that moment and making it known. So it's, it's really coming down to communication. Mm, yes. Honesty and being humble too. Honest. Uh, I absolutely. love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And then I always think to myself, okay, who is this? Who's the person that's offering me this advice or their opinion? Is it somebody I admire? Is it somebody who I aspire to be like? Is it somebody who shares my core values? If you can answer yes to those questions, I'm more likely to be receptive to somebody like that who's not coming across judgmental, critical, condescending, right? But if there's something that is said, somebody's offering me something and, and I think, oh, I don't know, that's, it just doesn't feel like it's in alignment with who I am, what I believe, what's important to me. 
then we can dismiss it. Mm, yes. We can dismiss it. We're all trying to figure this out. This mother yes. thing. And it may work for you, mm. may not work for me. So if we are learn to communicate with gentle, gentleness, compassion, and love, right? We want to also maintain somebody's dignity, acknowledging, I know that you mean well, but maybe that's hurtful. You know, and if it is, you could say that. I think a friendship should be able to, a strong friendship, a meaningful friendship should be able to withstand that honesty and love them anyways. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Being open and receptive is a sign also of being healthy, isn't it? Yes. We don't take everything personally. We're not offensive about exactly. This says exactly. a lot. Yeah, about a there's a difference between yeah reacting right when I, and I talk about uh, my emo- emotions. When our emotions can take over in that moment, we feel judged. If we're reactive, we can say things or do things or come across things in ways that we're just not proud. Like that's not me. You know, we're going to live with the regret and the and the shame of that or. Right? We can learn to manage ourselves, to govern ourselves, and to be able to hear something and respond in a way that's in alignment with who you are. Mm, yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. In alignment with, with what, who you are, right? In that moment. Mm-hmm. Yes. We're almost at the end. Gosh, Mirelle, and I had so many questions here for you. Way too many. But the time passed by so quickly, right? We're not even. <laughs> I do. Ah, wow. So I would like to mention another quote that I, I got here from your book that caught my attention. It was about comparison, which is we will naturally want to compare our kids to others. We cannot do this. No two mothers are the same. No two kids are the same. Just stop. <laughs> so you, you're very clear on that. See, comparison, that's another piece, right? That we tend to be kind of drawn to almost automatically. And I do know the difference between, within my own experience, between admiration and comparison. So I would love to hear from you a bit more about that as a mother. And I actually didn't know that mothers do this or did this. I I had no idea. So this is new to me. Oh, it's very (laughs) natural. It's Uh, very human (laughs) as as a mom. (laughs) It is our flesh, which is like women Mm -hmm. will naturally compare ourselves to other women. I just don't think we can help it. Um, in terms of our children, you know, where are they? How are they doing? How, how are they excelling? And who's, who's successful? And who is going on to elite colleges? And who, I mean, there's so many, this is such a huge area. So many things that I think can easily induce guilt in a mom to compare your child with somebody else's child and to see how things are going seemingly maybe are just going so well, they're going so smooth for everybody else. And yet for us, it can feel as though, oh, well, my child is not developing in the same way. They're not where that child should be, or they're not on that track or They're not excelling in that sport. And so I think life just gives us so many opportunities to compare and then to judge where we, areas where we think we might have failed. And I think that's a very natural part of motherhood. And so what do we do with that? It's not a healthy place to be. So I go back to no two people are alike. Like, as you said, no two moms are alike. No two children are alike. And to honor who I am, who my child is, they're on a different trajectory. Their interests are different. Their passions are different. Their strengths are different. And so to acknowledge who, who my child is and really focus on helping them grow into their fullest potential Mm. and worry less about what other people are doing. I think Mm. if we can come to a place, an honest place where we can celebrate other, other children's achievements and other friends' achievements and not thinking that it's a reflection on what we're doing wrong 
or highlighting a lack in our own family. I think that that's so healthy to be able to celebrate my own path, my growth, my family. Yes, beautifully said. Wow, profoundly and beautiful and necessary. <laughs> we all need to be reminded of that. And, and to me, it really goes back to fear again. That fear. right, the roots. That's right. Fear. We're always afraid of something, and that's why yes. we react. How amazing! Yes. Oh my God, Mirella, you you're doing wonderful. This is beautiful work. Very Thank much you, needed because that's a work that I don't know. I do have a speak. I have mom, mothers around me, and, but I am not a mother, so it's it's not as close. It's not a. It's real per se to me, mm-hmm. to my human experience. But I see how. Everything goes back to that fundamental, um, unfortunate truth of fear that we come a lot of times, most of of our lives are lived from that space, informed, uh, our choices are coming, our belief systems are coming from fear. So thank you so much for bringing this awareness into this reality and doing the beautiful work that you do. I appreciate it. And likewise, Valeria. Thank you for your work and for having me here. Oh my God, I love this. That's my sacred space, Mirella. Oh, I can tell. Oh, yes. yes, you lead with oh. so much heart. Gosh. I recognize that. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. So before we say goodbye for today, where's the best place to find more information about you, to hire you as a coach? Do you have programs? Do you work with groups online, offline? Talk to me about that. Mm-hmm. So right now I would direct your listeners to Amazon. Uh, Amazon is where you can find my book. It's SOS for the M-O-M. I know it spells out mom, but I like the alliteration. So the title is SOS for the M-O-M, A Christian Mom's Guide to Managing Emotions. So that book is available on Amazon and on my website. So my website is www.lifecoachmom.net. There's a a comedy, like you said, there's a page on my Life Coach Mom comedy and then more information also about the book. And that's the best way to to contact me as well. So I don't have any online courses or anything uh, else to to share at the moment, but I'm working on that. Yeah. So I'll have those links on the podcast profile, the podcast uh, page will be there. I guess I'll ask you these ending questions. I have too many here before we say goodbye. I usually end with a question. So I'll ask you this, this one. At this time, what do you feel is the world's greatest need? The world's greatest need is love. Yes. It's love. It's a divine love. Mm. Yeah. It's recognizing that we're incapable of the love that's necessary to mm. heal. Wow. Ah, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, divine love. Yes, Mm -hmm. a billion times to that again. Thank you so much for being so divinely wise. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's coming from that place. Thank you so much again for your presence, Mirella. My pleasure. And we'll talk soon. Bye for now. Okay. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Marella Acebo and her work, please visit lifecoachmom.net. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.